So both of these men um, have a, a great deal of, of knowledge. They have a great deal of, um, of youth and passion, and, and they are prepared uh, to make a journey. It, it's hard to imagine that um, the two uh, people uh, could have been um, uh, really better suited for this. From the river to the valley to the sea. All the places, all the people that you can meet. Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river, and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to episode 19 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. The day this episode releases, May 17th, 2023, is the 350th anniversary of the start of the famous expedition of Father Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet, who traveled from the Great Lakes through Wisconsin and down the Mississippi River. For a look back at the details and impact of their expedition, I talked with Michael Douglas, an enthusiastic historian and former director of Villa Louis Historic Site in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, who has a deep and abiding interest in the expedition. This single trip would prove to be enormously consequential for European colonial ambitions and for the lives of indigenous people in the region. Douglas sets the stage for our discussion by talking about the context in which the expedition occurred, advancing the economic and colonial interests of New France, that describes what we know about the progress of the trip itself. One aspect of their trip that really jumped out at me concerned how little food Marquette and Joliet brought with them. Douglas noted that the Europeans believed they would be traveling through an area of abundance, that there would be plenty of food along the way from game, wild plants, and maybe some additional food such as corn from native communities. So much of our modern conception of life in North America before factories and smartphones assumes hardships and scarcity, yet in 1673 a group of Europeans traveling by canoe for months knew that they could live comfortably off what the land and rivers provided. It's another reminder of the remarkable abundance and diversity in life in the world of the Mississippi River. Our discussion of the expedition also includes the indigenous people they met along the way, how many of them were from tribes that had already suffered terrible losses and dislocation from disease and wars in the Northeast, and must have been desperate to make sense of the tragedies they were in the middle of. I find this expedition a challenging topic to dig into. Its history is complicated and complex and offers no shortage of points to please some and annoy others. Most of what we know about the trip comes from the perspectives of the Europeans who were involved, some of whom, like Joliet, were out to make a profit, while others, including Marquette, were out to save souls. In addition, you know, one of the key regularly cited sources has had its authenticity questioned in recent years, which Douglas gets into near the end of this interview. While this trip would ultimately change the lives of many Native Americans, their voices are not represented in this conversation. I apologize for that. I reached out to a couple of tribal historians and invited them to participate, but I wasn't successful in those efforts. I'll keep working on that. As always, thanks go out to my Patreon supporters, those new and ongoing ones including Stephanie arntzen Strote. If Patreon isn't your thing, you can show some love by buying me a coffee. Go to my website, mississippivalleytraveler.com slash podcast to learn how to contribute either one of those ways. And now, let's get on with the interview. Michael Douglas was born and raised in Des Moines, Iowa, where he began a lifelong interest in history and the culture of indigenous North Americans. He graduated with a BA in anthropology from the University of Montana and attended Cooperstown graduate program in museum studies. He spent 32 years at the Wisconsin Historical Society, which included 30 years as director of Villa Louis Historic Site in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. 
He's also worked five seasons as a seasonal park ranger for the National Park Service at Effigy Mounds National Monument in Iowa. He's been active in 18th and 19th century fur trader reenactments and is now retired as a War of 1812 reenactor. He's presented numerous public programs on Marquette and Joliet's 1673 expedition and the history of the Upper Mississippi River and has lived along the banks of the Mississippi himself for 40 years. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Well, we have we're doing we're having this conversation today because this year marks uh, one of those significant uh, anniversaries. Uh, this year marks 350 years. It's a long time since uh, Marquette and Joliet um, uh, conducted their expedition uh, down the Mississippi River. So why don't we start off a little bit by uh, just talking about who these fellows were, who were Marquette and Joliet? Well, they were two very interesting men who lived in New France in the early 17th century, uh, mid 17th century, actually. Um, uh, Joliet, Louis Joliet, was a, a, a son of the country, if you will. Um, he was born um, near Quebec in uh, eighteen, excuse me, in uh, sixteen, um, in sixteen forty-five. Um, and he, uh, his father died when he was young. His mother remarried. The stepfather died a few years later, and Louis Joliet was was educated by the Jesuits in Quebec. Um, very appeared that he would uh, take orders and become a, a priest. He was a gifted musician. He was a harpsichordist. He was an organist. Um, he was uh, a bright boy. He um, he learned languages. He, of course, um, spoke Latin fluently. Um, his father had been a wagon maker for the Associates of a Hundred. And one wonders how well connected he might have been before that. It would appear that people took note of Louis Joliet. Um, when he was 16 or 17, um, he uh, presented along with a, another student um, a thesis in philosophy um, and debated Jean Talon, who was uh, uh, intendant. Um, and Talon was impressed, apparently. There was some something published about his uh, taking note of these young scholars. Um, but uh, Joliet determines not uh, to become a priest. Um, indeed, he is attracted to perhaps the more lucrative fur trade. Um, perhaps he um, was not prepared to take on a life of celibacy. We don't know. Um, we know that he would eventually marry and father six children. Um, but he truly was a son of New France. Um, in contrast, Jacques Marquette was born in France. He was born to a, a middle class family. Um, he, too, was sent to uh, Jesuit uh, schools at an early age, nine or ten, uh, various numbers are reported, um, and he was, he was groomed from an early age uh, to become a priest. Um, this was a time when the Jesuits were reaching out uh, across the globe. Um, their successes in Paraguay in the 1540s were, were renowned. Um, they worked diligently among the Guanari Indians in Paraguay. Uh, 30 villages were converted, uh, numbering something like 80,000 individuals. Um, the Jesuit relations were reports of activities in the Americas uh, that were published in France, and Marquette would have had access to these. He would have, he would have read about the uh, the work of the missionaries, the exotic uh, cultures they were encountering. Um, he would have known, um, too, about um, some of the martyrdoms and the, um, and the sacrifices that, that, that Jesuits made in the, in the name of evangelism. Uh, the, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, had been founded by Ignatius of Loyola, and he had uh, stated from the very beginning that it was necessary uh, that we enter the world of other cultures so that they will, that we should enter the door of other cultures so that they would exit through ours, and really lifted up the, um, the, the mandate uh, from uh, St. Matthew to go to all nations and spread the good news of our Savior Jesus Christ. Um, these, these were men who were fervent. They were deeply uh, committed um, 
to the, the notion um, that people of faith had a, a, a commitment, had an obligation, had a holy co- obligation to share the good news of, of the risen Christ with, with other nations. Um, and we, we can't underestimate the role of this. Um, it, it, was, it was fundamental. Um, Catholic world in the 17th century really saw the church as the one true moral authority. And this was not just something nice. It was something that had to be done. So we have two very different perspectives. We have an individual coming out of New France, uh, Louis Joliet, uh, representing the interests of the fur trade. We have um, Jacques Marquette representing the missionary um, passion, if you will. And it, it indeed is a passion, I think. What is all this predicated on? This is all predicated um, by the establishment of the fur trade. Uh, the beaver fur had been discovered almost at the very beginning. When Cartier is first mapping and exploring the St. Lawrence, um, they see the Algonquin natives coming out of the forest wearing these robes of, of beaver skins. And they know that beaver is the most important fiber in the world for making of hats. And beaver fur felt hats are the epitome of fashion in Europe. And the resources are almost gone. And now they find beaver in North America. And in, in this perhaps mythic, but this, this exchange between the very first Basque fishermen and the Algonquin Indians, the exchange of European-made knives for beaver pelts um, began an industry. And by the 17th century, by the by the founding of, of, of Montreal, by the founding of, of Quebec in 1608, the fur trade is established and the French are seeking a trade partner and they engage with the Huron. Um, and they become trade partners with the Huron, um, and they will become missionary partners with the Huron. To the south, um, the Dutch enter the whole world of the fur trade and of westward expansion in the 1620s, and they establish trade relations with the Iroquois, ancient enemies of the Huron. And in due course, the Dutch will supply guns to the Iroquois, which enable them to go to war with the Huron. But before that happens in the 1640s, the Huron are decimated by smallpox. So the Europeans not only bring a zeal for converts, a zeal for fur trading, they also bring the disease. And the smallpox epidemics are devastating. Between the 1636 and 1641, the Huron lose thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And in their weakened state, they just are not able to resist the the incursions of the Iroquois into their land, and it it pushes the Huron west. Um, They flee uh, Lake Huron, they flee the Georgian Bay, they flee across Michigan all the way to the Mississippi River and eventually all the way up to the Shawanigan Bay and Lake Superior. And they're just a fragment of who they once were. But their trade partners and their mission partners in New France follow them. So that's what we're beginning to see as Marquette and Joliet began kind of moving toward each other, if you will, um, in the early uh, 1670s. 1666, uh, Marquette, uh, before he has finished um, all of his studies in France, before he's ordained, um, he comes to the New World and continues his studies in Canada, in Quebec. So, So Marquette is in Canada. He's beginning to learn native languages. He understands how critical it is to be able to speak the language, to be able to extract the information that he really hopes to get. So he first begins uh, studying the Montenay language. And by 1673, it's said that he knows six native languages. In 1668, he, um, he leaves uh, Quebec with Father Claude de Blonde, who is making his way up through the ranks 
of Jesuit leadership in the New World, Claude Dablon will eventually become the superior of all Jesuits in New France. Um, and Marquette and Dablon establish a relationship and they travel uh, together uh, to um, found the Ottawa Mission at Sault Ste. Marie. And, uh, and that is in 1668. In 1670, Marquette is moved from Sault Ste. Marie out to Schwamigan Bay after Alloway uh, pulls back. So Marquette, with some knowledge of Ottawa language, uh, goes to Schwamigan, where there are Ottawa peoples living as well as remnant Huron. He doesn't speak Huron very well. And the Huron were used to Father Alloway, who spoke Huron fluently. And, and Marquette is reminded, again, of how important language is. While he is there at Chihuahuan, Illinois Indians begin uh, visiting. And later he will say that the Illinois um, have had some exposure with, with at least second-degree Europeans, They've heard from others about European traders. They're wearing glass beads. They clearly have had some contact and they want to have a missionary come to their villages in the Illinois. And Marquette is just ecstatic and writes to DeBlon um, about the fact that Illinois have been sharing these stories about how they have walked from the Illinois country and they describe a river, a great river. When the Illinois come to La Pointe, they cross a great river, which is nearly a league in width, flows north to south into such a distance of the Illinois who do not know what a canoe is, have not yet heard any mention of its mouth. They simply know that there are some very large nations lower down than themselves, some of whom toward the east southwest of their country, raised two crops of Indian corn in a year. Um, a nation that they call the Shawano come and see them last summer. And this young man who has been giving to me, this young man who has been given to me and is teaching me the language, saw them. They are laden with glass beads, which shows that they have had communication with Europeans. They had come overland a journey of nearly 30 days before reaching the country. It is hard to believe that the great river that discharges its waters in Virginia, and we think rather that it has its mouth in California. If the savages who promised to make me a canoe do not break their word to me, we shall explore this river as far as we can. And he goes on to describe. So that is Marquette and Shawamigan in 1670. Now, meantime, Louis Joliet um, has made a decision to enter the fur trade, and Louis Joliet um, has established himself at Sault Ste. Marie and has entered the trade. In 1671, uh, Governor Frontenac and Intendant Jean Talon determined that it is time to make a claim to the lands touched by all of the Great Lakes. So they send word out through uh, their contacts, through the missionaries and others, to invite nations to Sault Ste. Marie for a great ceremony in June of 1671. And in June of 1671, all of the waters touched by the Great Lakes and James Bay are claimed for France. And at this time, Talon um, instructs Marquette, excuse me, instructs Louis Joliet uh, that he wishes him to lead an expedition to map a route to what they hope is the Mississippi River and to figure out exactly where the Mississippi River goes. And Claude Dablon, who is at that ceremony, also knows the man who needs to go with Louis Joliet. Um, now, the government cannot offer any funding to uh, subsidize this expedition, but they can offer uh, Joliet trading rights. And so those are extended to Joliet, which are, are, are worth 
a vast amount of money. And we have to assume that the Jesuits are underwriting uh, Marquette's um, role um, in this whole journey. So the two men um, meet uh, sometime in the late summer of 1672, somewhere in the vicinity of Sault Ste. Marie, St. Ignace, and they begin making plans for an expedition to leave in the spring of 1673. Um, by this time, uh, Marquette has, has mastered uh, languages. Uh, Joliet is, a, is a, a gifted scholar, a bright man who's also a, a cartographer. He knows how to use um, the, the tools of map making, um, and he, um, he knows his way around the Western country. So both of these men um, have a, a great deal of, of knowledge. They have a great deal of, um, of youth and passion, and, and they are prepared uh, to make a journey. It, it's hard to imagine that um, the two uh, people uh, could have been um, uh, really better suited for this. Uh, this is what Deb Juan has to say about Louis Joliet. Um, they were not mistaken in their choice that they made of Sir Joliet, for he is a young man born in this country who possesses all the qualifications that could be desired for such an undertaking. He has experience and knows the languages spoken in the country of the Ottawas, where he has passed several years. He possesses stack, tact, and prudence, which are the chief qualities necessary for the success of a voyage as dangerous as it is difficult. Finally, he has the courage to dread nothing where everything is to be feared. Consequently, he has fulfilled all the expectations entertained of him. And if, after having passed through a thousand dangers, he had not unfortunately been wrecked in the very harbor, um, his canoe having been upset below the Sault St. Louis near Montreal, where he lost both his men, his papers, and once he would have escaped only by a sort of miracle, nothing would have been left to be desired in the success of his voyage. We're jumping way ahead when we get to that last part. We'll come back to that later. The point being is that Louis Joliet was extremely well suited for this voyage. And Father Marquette, although he had only been in this country for seven years, is also extremely uh, well suited uh, for this journey. And so it comes together. Uh, two canoes. Um, well, two before we get into the, Excuse before me, we jump into the journey itself, let me... Uh, Let's set the context a little bit more too. I, I, at the time, um, the the French communities in, in this part of uh, Canada were basically uh, Montreal was kind of the center, the capital of French Canada at that time. Um, yes, and then may I guess there probably would have been some community at Quebec City. Yes. And then the other communities that you mentioned really were around uh, Sault Ste. Marie, like at St. Ignace. Um, and so there was kind of an, uh, was that more of a Jesuit based outpost, a missionary outpost at that time? Sault Ste. Marie was, I believe. Uh, we're really getting into the, the missions. Um, New France would have extended through Trois Rivières, uh, Trois Rivières, um, and, and really beginning to push um, up the rivers. Um, uh, really, what was advancing New France was the advancement of the fur trade. Um, so we're really seeing the fur trade uh, starting to move in um, beyond the uh, the farm uh, communities of of, uh, of Quebec, Quebec City, of Quebec, including uh, Montreal. Um, so yes, that's that's right. So then uh, the other uh, for the um, Native Americans in that part of the world at that time then. Yeah. You've already hinted at this. Uh, there was all they were already uh, faced with a lot of disruptions in their communities. The Huron had suffered massive losses from smallpox. Um, the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee, I think, is what they use today. Yes. Um, they um, they had also suffered tremendous losses, and there were a lot of battles going on. There was already there were already fights happening for control of the fur trade and the benefits from that. And there was a, so there was already a fair substantial dislocation from the East Coast of uh, survivors who migrated more toward the Great Lakes and the Midwest, if I remember right. Would that be about right? Um, that's that's absolutely accurate. Um, so we really have to look at the at the combined um, impacts of European disease um, and historic nations being decimated by disease, and then the addition of of the European machinations of, of empire building and 
supplying different nations with with armaments and then the dislocation of that. So yes, we we are watching a massive diaspora of Eastern nations being forced west, um, having to adapt to all kinds of new situations. And also one can only imagine um, Tinder, a Tinder and open to looking for answers to extraordinarily difficult questions of why has so much changed so quickly in such a short amount of time? And, and, and what does this mean for us? So we see in some cases, I think, an openness to, um, at least to the missionary efforts, um, that we just really, really have, have to ponder. Um, so yes, it's an extraordinarily um, challenging time. Um, the the Harusone are, are and it's, it's difficult sometimes, you know, when you, when you are enmeshed in, in reading these historic records, you, you start using all of these historic names. And of course, uh, we're talking about not First Nation people or not Native Americans. We're talking about Indians. We're talking about Iroquois. We're talking about all of these, these, these names that come down to us. And we need to be sensitive to that as well. Um, uh, we do need uh, to also acknowledge um, the challenges of looking at, at warfare in this era. Um, the um, it was it was not a good thing um, to be captured as an enemy by the Hadassona. <laughs> it was not a good thing at all, um, and uh, um, it could be tough. So right. um, so we there's just there's just there's a lot of challenging pieces. It's what makes this whole time period so fascinating. And the notion in in 1671, um, it just seems to me to be a a, a very positive time period for New France. The so-called Iroquois Wars are now at peace. The English have taken over the Dutch colonies in New York. The English have established the Hudson's Bay Company to the north. The French are looking west. They see their future in the west. They have claimed these lands. Now they need to understand these lands. Um, and they have this great plan. It has an agenda. They have two well-equipped, bright, youngish men with an agenda. And that really brings us, I think, to the spring of 1673. Hey, Dean Klinkenberg here, interrupting myself. Just wanted to remind you that if you'd like to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the river better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series set and set in places along the Mississippi. Read those books to find out how many different ways my protagonist, Frank Dodge, can get into trouble. My newest book, Mississippi River Mayhem, details some of the disasters and tragedies that happened along Old Man River. Find any of them wherever books are sold. Let's get into it then. Uh, so uh, at what point did uh, did they know they were going to take this trip? And then what did they do to, to get ready for this? They had to know they were going to be gone probably for months. Um, right. how, how did they prep for something like this? Well, um, I, I think that certainly in the case of Father Marquette, he had been mentally preparing for this for years. He had been mentally preparing for this when he was still living in France. So he had, he had thought about this specifically um, the uh, the expedition comes together in the fall of, of 1672. And it comes together with, with Marquette and Joliet actually meeting and beginning to, to plan um, together um, in, um, in the vicinity between uh, Sault Ste. Marie, where uh, Joliet is, is established, and St. Ignace, where Marquette is. Um, they certainly review um, all of the reports they've heard, um, uh, they likely had an opportunity to, to interview um, Claude Alloway again and get what he learned. They had an opportunity to have correspondence with Claude Deblon. Um, he had been as far as um, the Mascouten village on the Fox River uh, out of De Pere. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, they're, they're really clarifying all the knowledge they have and all of the possibilities that, that could go wrong and, and uh, and looking at um, the tools they would need. 
Um, Marquette is undoubtedly putting equipment together, compasses, astrolobes, um, other cartographic tools that he's going to need um, to make accurate measure of, of latitude. Um, and so, um, um, and they needed to have canoes built. Uh, what, what sort of a canoe would they take? Uh, one can only imagine that a, uh, the traditional express canoe of 16 to 17 feet was too small. Uh, a Matre canoe, uh, the great express canoes that uh, traveled goods across Lake Superior, uh, 36 feet long, paddled by 12 people, is too big. Um, the, uh, the North canoes um, that tended to be about 24 to 27 feet long and about 50 to 60 inches wide, um, my guess would have been just about perfect. Uh, um, the crew they're going to take is is uh, is lean. Um, they plan to take five men. Um, again, we don't really know who they are. Um, some sources that I've, I've consulted uh, suggest that they are Métis. Um, they are, are men uh, born of mixed marriage uh, of European fathers and indigenous mothers. Um, we don't know that as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we don't know exactly who they were. They don't have names. Um, and we also learned that their provisions are extraordinarily lean. Um, we are told they took Indian corn and smoked meat. So clearly they intend to, uh, to secure uh, provisions um, along the route. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of confidence in their ability to, uh, to acquire food along the way, it sounds like. Well, I, I would I would absolutely agree, but but I think that we also have to give credit uh, uh, to Louis Joliet of, of knowing the skills of the men that he recruited, and just um, just the um, the expectation of the abundance of the country. Um, they're leaving um, they're leaving early. Uh, they're leaving in, in mid May. Um, they they actually uh, embark from Saint Ignace on May seventeenth. Of 1673. Um, well, never... let, let me just ask real quick for that then too. You mentioned before the languages. So just give me a sense, like what languages did Marquette speak at the time that they left? And what about Joliet? Like what language was he fluent in as well? Well, uh, their native language, of course, was French and their uh, scholastic language was Latin. Uh, Marquette had learned Montenay and Ottawa um, and had picked up Huron and was learning um, Illinois uh, languages. And these are all Algonquin languages. So there's some, um, there's some um, linguistic uh, ties, uh, but they're nuanced. And, um, you know, the more nuanced you can speak, the, the better your success will be in any level of communication, much, much less inspirational or educational. Um, Marquette, um, uh, Joliet, on the other hand, uh, would have been working um, among the Ottawa um, uh, and to, I would think, among the Anishinaabe as well, um, who are also beginning to make their way uh, west at this point. Um, so they, um, they um, uh, maybe a smattering of Miami um, and uh, uh, perhaps some Mascoutin. Um, and again, these are all Algonquian languages. Um, so um, they're going to be listening and um, doing their best to to, to nuance their own own language, uh, it's it's actually sort of mind boggling when you think about <laughs> about what's going on in guys' heads. <laughs> Absolutely, so, and that, you know, I, I, I as somebody who's tried to learn you know French and Spanish and a little bit of Italian, these are all Latin based languages, and I, uh, but they're very different from each other, and the vocabulary can be so different from one another. So you can just imagine right. the challenges of trying to keep that all straight in your head as you're communicating with people who di speak different uh, dialects of Algonquin or different versions of Algonquin. So that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, indeed. Um, so anyway, um, so so there they are. Um, I've never been to the Straits of Mackinac on May 17th. My guess is it's still a little chilly. Um, their canoes, as we have suggested, were probably in the 24 foot length. Um, they're loaded with equipment. Um, they have both learned uh, a certain amount of, uh, of knowledge about Native American diplomacy. They understand the importance of giving gifts. So their canoes would have undoubtedly been laden with as many gifts as they could have, uh, could have mustered. Um, and these gifts would have uh, been uh, from the range of, of fur trade goods and, and religious iconography. 
There could have been Jesuit rings. There could have been crosses. There could have been holy cards on the part of Marquette. Um, there could have been blankets and axes and knives and beads um, on the part of um, uh, Louis Joliet. Um, so undoubtedly, a, a good amount of canoe space was given over to gifts. Um, a good amount of it was given over to equipment. Um, and then uh, what was needed for um, their five men. Um, plus, there was some extra room, and we'll we'll uh, learn in a in a few minutes when we get to that point um, why that was important as well. Um, so they get started, and there's some um, th there's some very clear stopping off places along the way. Um, it's not a it's not a straight shot to the Mississippi. It's a working their way through um, through the known Jesuit world, through the known world of New France. So they are traveling um, initially from St. Ignace um, into uh, Lake Michigan, and they're following the, the shore of Lake Michigan and coming down to uh, La Bay, uh, the Green Bay. What they don't record, which I find is fascinating, is the, the perilous entry into Green Bay. Um, it's a, it's, you can see when you look at the map how... Um, how there was at one time the peninsula was connected. It's very rocky. It's very dangerous. Um, all of the groups that have reenacted the Marquette and Joliet expedition have had an extremely difficult time um, getting into Green Bay. It's, it's perilous on the best of days. Uh, they were coming in um, in late May when the waters of Lake Michigan were still extraordinarily cold, um, and it would have been dicey. They don't mention it. They say nothing about it. Hmm. Uh, they, are, they, it they, they are so giddy about getting this trip started that it's just like there's nothing that's too challenging. They're just they're just they're just on a um, they're just on this sort of expedition high, and they are they're making their way as quickly as they can um, to the Jesuit presence at at La Bay. Um, now La Bay um, is a is a a, a metropolitan. Uh, native village, something like 10,000 souls made up of all of these remnant nations that have fled the East um, are gathered now in, in Green Bay, La Verde Bay, La Bay, um, and in De Pere, uh, which is kind of slightly um, west of Green Bay proper, uh, was the, the mission St. Xavier. Um, and that was the, uh, the Jesuit uh, presence in um, in La Bay. Um, so they make their way to St. Xavier um, and they refortify in, in St. Xavier and they and they uh, refresh themselves um, and spend some days there. And of course, um, every time they stop, there's just, um, there's prayers and supplications. And, you know, we're now, we're in the middle of May, it's the month of the Blessed Virgin. So there's lots of, lots of special attention to uh, prayers and novenas and so forth and so on surrounding the Blessed Virgin. And, um, and then, and then they're prepared um, to to leave from there, um, and so they do leave uh, uh, from Green Bay in um, late May, um, and this is the first time they say it. It's it's really um, they meet their first real challenge, and they begin to ascend the the Fox River, and the the rapids on the Lower Fox are are just extremely challenging, of uh, very sharp rocks. Um, again, the description that we have says in low water, this is just treacherous um, for those who are obliged to have to drag the canoes over the rocks. Um, and it's sort of, you sort of wonder, was um, was Marquette one of those obliged to do this? Or was that what those five guys were brought along uh, from the ranks of the Voyagers who have not yet become Voyagers? But that that's another thing that's kind of developing right. if you will um right did, um, so did, um, did the missionary priests have to do any of the hard labor as part of this trip right yeah, exactly exactly so I, I just want to point out again too like these canoes we're talking birch bark canoes right right you don't drag right. birch bark canoes over sharp rocks yeah so uh, i'm assuming they probably had to do some repairs along the way absolutely absolutely i mean every every birch bark canoe carried a roll of birch bark and a bucket of uh of pitch and um, and uh, pine tar and so forth and so on, uh, and what topped the um, yes, you, that was part and parcel to travel in yeah. a birch bark canoe, um, and you were very careful with them. Um, you just do not drag them um, anywhere ever. 
Um, so, um, and it, so there, so they, so there they are, and uh, and so they 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 ascend the Fox River uh, to a point near what is today uh, the city of Bruin, uh, Wisconsin, and there is a a, a Maskutin village there. It's actually a village um, that is made up of of Maskutin, um, Kickapoo, and Miami. Uh, again, one of these sort of assembled uh, communities of of, of remnant bands that have, have been forced out of their traditional homelands and are now living along the Fox River in, in what is Wisconsin. And they're particularly impressed with Miami guides, Miami people that they meet there. And out of the Miami um, who they meet and are, are treated very well, uh, really say they, they are the superior um, people of this community. Um, they, they, they truly strike up a, a relationship and ask for help from the Miami. Um, and the Miami say they're, they're, we, we know there's a way um, and we can, we can help you get there. Um, so two Miami guides leave the Mascoutin village and, and travel with, um, with Marquette and Joliet uh, west uh, uh, another hundred miles or so. I'm so this was, uh, they really wanted the guides to come along with them to help them make the connection to the Wisconsin River, as I remember. Is that essentially right? Um, that is absolutely uh, correct. Um, they were, the um, you know, the, they're, they're noting vegetation. They're, they're making all kinds of observational notes um, as they're making their way up the Fox River. And among the other things they're, they're noting are just these vast beds of, of wild rice, um, the first people they encounter in the, when they enter Wisconsin are the uh, the so-called uh, Fall of On Indians. Um, and Fall of On uh, translates as wild oats. Wild oats refers to wild rice. Um, this is a nation we today know as the Menominee. Um, and the uh, the Menominee name for wild rice is Menomen, or the Algonquin name for wild rice is Menomen. Um, the Menominee, and, and so the, the wild rice beds are just um, um, abundant. And the wild rice uh, is just in full uh, reed um, in um, in late May, um, so the the Wisconsin is a is a excuse me the Fox River is a is a is a rich territory and it's it's just loaded with game and loaded with with wild rice and and so forth and so on. Um, um, it said for this reason we greatly needed our two guides, and these are two Miami guides who safely conducted us to a portage of 2,700 papis, paces and helped us to transport our canoes to enter that river. After which they returned home, leaving us alone in this unknown country mm. in the hands of Providence. <laughs> so this is where the rubber meets the road. This is when the adventure really begins. Huh? This is when the adventure really begins. Yeah. And, and again, Marquette says, thus we left the waters flowing to Quebec four or 500 leagues from here to float on those that would since four take us through strange lands. Before embarking thereon, we began to gather a new devotion to the Blessed Virgin Immaculate which we practice daily, addressing to her special prayers to place under her protection, both our own persons and the success of our voyage. And after mutually encouraging one another, we entered our canoes. <laughs> there they go. <laughs> and it's really, it's just, it's just so lovely. It's, it's almost too lovely. And we'll come back to that later. Okay. Right. It's almost too lovely. Um, so they start down the Wisconsin River, um, and they are now traveling in Ho-Chunk territory. Um, and I don't know where the Ho-Chunk are. I can't imagine they don't know what's going on. But they choose, uh, they choose not to engage. Um, so they travel down the, through these beautiful, beautiful lands along the lower Wisconsin River. Um, they see buffalo, they see fish, they see birds, um, they see a uh, the so-called river of a thousand islands, and it is beautiful. It is beautiful in June, um, and they are uh, they are they are in high spirits. Excuse me, um, they are in high spirits. 
they are feeling they are feeling great. And I think that they are feeling blessed. They are feeling blessed. They're feeling like they are on a righteous mission and they are feeling like the way is being smooth for them. And that has just got to put you into a, a, a very positive frame of mind. And so it's just with this quiet exultation that they enter the Mississippi River on the morning of June 17th, 1673. And Marquette simply says, today we entered the Mississippi with a joy that I cannot express. It's a it's a beautiful sentence too. I hope you know. I hope there's some uh, historical truth to it. Like maybe he, hope I'm sure he said something like that. I'm sure he did too. I mean, I, I want to believe he did. I want I want to ponder what he meant. Was he speechless? Were there no words? Were there just nothing that could really give voice to to what this was? Um, you know, I've, I, I have talked. I've talked about these guys on the river literally dozens of times on boats sitting at the mouth of the Wisconsin River. And I have sat, and I will say right now, sitting in those two birch bark canoes, looking at that vast gorge, looking north to the bluff soaring 550 feet above the, above the water, looking south, not knowing exactly where they were, but surely knowing that they have found something of profound importance, something that will change the course of history, not just for them, but for the world. It truly was phenomenal. And, you know, it has been said that, that their discovery of, of the river was as important in its day as Lewis and Clark's expedition was to the young United States. It's important as the Apollo 11's landing was to 20th century Americans. This gave confidence, this gave knowledge, and this gave a sense of mission to New France. It was profound indeed. Still, things are just quiet and things are just going along seemingly impossibly well. Um, and they begin to descend the river. And it um, isn't until they get to the confluence of the Des Moines, almost at the southern end of, uh, of, of, of Iowa, Wisconsin, that, that they see the first traces of other human occupation. They're taking precautions. So they're sleeping in their canoes at night on the water. They're posting a guard every night. They're very much concerned that they ha might have some sort of hostile encounter. Um, and finally, um, they do find uh, their way uh, to, um, uh, 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 they, find, they find a pathway and they, they know that the pathway leads uh, to some sort of settlement. And they-, oh, they when, At the point where they hit the Wisconsin River then, so they had, they were kind of um, near the Western end of the Ho-Chunks territory whom they apparently did not have any contact with for all we can tell. And then on the other side of the river uh, would have been uh, Dakota people uh, who were, I think, somewhat related. I think they spoke, they both spoke Siouan languages. I don't remember what the relationships were between the Ho-Chunk and the Dakota, but uh, it's another group of people. It's a, it's a group of, of uh, it's a community that really hadn't had the same level of disruption as uh, tribes had east of the Mississippi. This was kind of the context they were about to enter, as I understand it. Is that kind of what I, you I, think? I, I think so. Well, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yes, um, you're absolutely right that, that Ho Chunk um, is a Siouan language, um, as is Natawisiu or the Dakota, um, and um, they are fairly distant. There's certainly um, some commonality, and indeed, um, the to this day, uh, Dakota and, and Lakota. I tell stories of the effigy mounds and the stories of the mounds of the Driftless region, um, which um, which are the same stories that, that Ho Chungra uh, tell. Um, so they are they are both languages that sprout from the same um, linguistic tree. Um, the Dakota um, certainly will range south uh, to this area 
um, more so um, as time advances. Um, indeed, Marquette had encountered Dakota when he was at the Mission Saint Esprit. The Dakota began to threaten and harass the Hurons, which really prompted the Hurons to retreat east again, which took uh, Marquette east again. So and he he specifically refers to the uh, Natalisi, the Dakota, as our Iroquois. Um, so he really sees uh, this nation as a threatening nation. So yes, I think you are absolutely correct in thinking they would have had a wary eye um, to the west side of the Mississippi River. Um, and they, of course, don't really have any sense of, at all of where these indigenous boundaries are. Um, so they don't they don't know what what they're going to find. Mm -hmm. um, when they do find this village, uh, they find a they find a group of people related to the Illinois, the Peoria, um, who have knowledge of um, of the French and who um, who greet them, who, who greet them with this um, with this uh, um, this uh, openness. It's just it's just again, it's it's almost too beautiful. Um, uh, they say, oh, how glorious is the sun on the day when you, oh, Frenchmen, have arrived. You know, it's just, it's, it's, I'm uh, paraphrasing. Um, it's, uh, it's a, uh, the, the words are inscribed on, on Marquette's uh, monument in his home village in France. It's really quite beautiful. And you mentioned before that this was around the Des Moines River. So we're getting now, yeah. so modern day kind of the border around Missouri, Illinois, that the northwest corner of Missouri. That's right. And they, and and they go ahead, please. Uh, just a real quick thing. I just wanted to point out that the uh, there's a state, there's a historic site there now, the Illiniwek Village uh, State Historic Site uh, that right. uh, I think as far as we know, we believe is probably the village that Marquette and Joliet encountered, the site of where that village was. But, I think I think that's true. Um, so yeah, so now we're beginning to really uh, a map. Um, we're getting to we're really getting to to start linking to um, seeing what what their knowledge is going to bring forward. Um, so they 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 begin to figure out, uh, you know, pretty quickly. They're they're discovering very important rivers. So they 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 map the the confluence of the Des Moines. They will map the confluence of the Missouri. They will map the confluence of the Ohio. Um, they will come to understand that the Ohio is not the Mississippi, which had been speculated um, before. Um, and they will begin to see that the M Mississippi really runs in a much more north-south route than a, um, than a, uh, a southwest route. Um, one of their very, very specific objectives was to figure out where the mouth of the Mississippi River was. Um, there was that hope. There was that possibility um, that it went west, and in fact, that California was much, much closer, and that uh, and finding um, the Mississippi emptying into the Bay of California uh, would have been a a, a route um, to to China. Um, that that notion that there was still a passage um, was 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 very much alive. Um, so they are they are they are really very specifically uh, to determine that. Um, so they continue um, along the way. Um, they are fascinated by their observance of indigenous cultural traits, uh, observances, uh, diplomacy. Um, they are fascinated with the use of the pipe, the calumet, as a as a prayer uh, instrument and as a friendship instrument. Um, they are given a calumet, which will uh, play favorably into their encounter with with. With indigenous indigenous people, um, they um, they really the journals would suggest that they are learning nuance the nuance of indigenous diplomacy in a new way, and that they practice it, that they are sensitive to it, they're intelligent enough to understand what they're seeing, and they're putting it to use. Um, so they're just they're 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 they are setting a standard for peaceful diplomacy, and they are gathering information. Um, they make their way uh, past uh, the Illinois River. They make their way past uh, the Arkansas River, and again, in 
in conversation with nations they're meeting, they learn that the Mississippi River uh, continues to the south and that there are Europeans as they near the mouth. And they deduce that these are Spaniards and they deduce that it is not well for them to have encounters with the Spanish. Um, they sense that they understand where the Mississippi goes, that it in, indeed does empty into the Gulf of Mexico and no place else. Um, they feel that um, they have enough knowledge and that it is time to um, to begin um, to, to beat a, a hasty uh, retreat home. Um, they have achieved their objective of finding the Illinois, of finding favorable response to the Illinois, and really establishing a bond with the Illinois. Um, they are shown, um, they are suggested a better route than the Wisconsin River um, to get back to Michigan, Lake Michigan. And so they, and so using the advice of the, of the Illinois, um, they make their way up the Illinois River and then to the Des Plaines and across the Chicago Portage and back to Lake Michigan that way. Um, and it indeed is a better way. Along the way, they encounter um, the Illinois at Kaskaskia, and this will become a, a focal point. Um, this will be the, the Illinois that they ultimately um, choose to, um, to really connect with. Um, and, um, and so, um, so they return. Um, so they, they, they make their way back. Um, sadly, um, on this trip, uh, Marquette has begun to develop um, some gastrointestinal issues. He has, um, he has developed um, a dysentery, perhaps, or at least, uh, at least uh, uh, GI issues, shall we say. He, he is just not feeling well at all. Um, he gets back as far as the Mission St. Xavier and De Pere and remains there and starts putting his, uh, his, his papers together. Uh, Louis Joliet um, continues on and makes his way back to uh, Sault Ste. Marie um, and spends the winter there, uh, preparing his reports, finishing his maps, uh, uh, putting all of his, um, all of his, his goods um, in order. Um, so this takes us um, into the into the winter of, of 1674. Um, they spend the, the autumn uh, resting, uh, recuperating, uh, reflecting, um, getting a sense, preparing reports and, and forwarding reports on to Deblon and others on, on, on what they found. So we, um, we get to the, the spring of 1674 um, and a couple of things uh, of, Great importance happened. Um, Marquette has made the decision and has the go ahead to return to the Illinois and establish a mission. Um, it had been his intention. He had said uh, when he first set off that if he found the Mississippi, he would uh, name the river, the Conception River, in honor of the Blessed Virgin. Um, and now he will found a mission at Kaskaskia which he will call the mission of Immaculate Conception, which is kind of cool. Um, um, but, um, but he's just too sick to travel. Um, he just can't, he can't do it. And he, um, and he's doctoring in De Pere uh, at the mission and he's, he's trying to, to get his health together and trying to get the resources organized uh, to travel um, back to the Illinois. Um, he finally does um, uh, get uh, things underway in October of 1674. Um, gets about as far as, as Chicago and just can't travel any further um, that winter. Um, is able to, to pick up the journey again, but is really suffering. He's, he's, a, he's, he's very ill um, and he, um, he managed to be able to, to travel again in late March, early April, just, just right exactly where we are today talking about this um, right during Holy Week. Um, he makes it uh, to... Um, back to Kaskaskia and he's there to celebrate the Triduum and has a uh, Holy Thursday and Good Friday and the Easter Vigil and Easter Sunday. Um, he, uh, he preaches to 1500 Illinois, um, but he, um, he's just not, he's just not well. And um, he realizes he's gotta get home. And so, uh, and so he starts out and he just doesn't really 
get very far before he's overcome uh, near Ludington, uh, Michigan, and he he dies there. Uh, just a couple of weeks short of his 38th birthday, um, he dies on May 18th, I believe, um, 1675, um, and is buried there. Um, a couple of years later, his remains are, are disinterred and his, uh, his body is taken back to um, St. Ignace. Meantime, in the spring of 1674, Louis Joliet is ready to return to Montreal. Um, so he is, uh, he has loaded up his canoe uh, with all of his papers and all of his instruments and his precious journals and his precious maps. And he, um, he sets off in his canoe and uh, somewhere around the rapids of Lachine, um, just near the confluence of the Ottawa River, uh, near Montreal. Um, he gets into some terrible rapids and his canoe capsizes. Um, it's the water is cold. It was a rugged, a rugged misadventure. The two men in his canoe perish. His precious box of journals and maps and instruments uh, sinks to the bottom of the river. Um, he clings to a rock for hours. Uh, you know, the legend has it that the fishermen who never fish in that part of the river uh, are happen to be there and see him and, and pull him out, but he has lost everything, including almost his life. So I, I, I think he, like me, was, didn't know what to make of it. He didn't know what had happened, what was happening with Marquette at this point. He didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, he was brilliant. He had made these observations. He had made maps. He had prepared journals. He had prepared reports. Theoretically, he had prepared a set of notes, which he had left behind at Sault Ste. Marie um, that were later destroyed by fire. Um, we do know that that summer, he has an extensive interview with Claude Dablon. And Dablon, we believe, uh, made copious notes and really extracted every bit of memory he possibly could of Louis Joliet. Um, and then Louis Joliet moves on with his life. Mm -hmm. Louis Joliet marries, um, becomes important in the fur trade, will become involved in exploration and serve the government of New France all his days until the end of the 17th century. A remarkable man, a remarkable man. And truly, as has been suggested many, many times, um, in all rights, it probably should be known as the Joliet and Marquette expedition. <laughs> jo Joliet uh, truly was um, the brilliant mind behind the expedition. But if he was a brilliant mind, Marquette was the heart and the passion and the zeal in the expedition. And it really was the braiding of those two things together, I think, that has made this epic expedition just so compelling. So sorting out now, 300 years later, 350 years later, the myth and the reality and the significance is challenging. Mm. And trying to sort out the relationship of this truly remarkable achievement with the fact that it represents the epitome of the tools of conquest that would change the lives of indigenous people forever makes it an extraordinarily challenging um, topic, but one that I just am drawn to. Oh, it's a, it's a big story. It's a very big story. I think. And, and and uh, I, you know, I didn't realize this until fairly recently, too, that, you know, that there were such substantial gaps in what we actually know. So, you know, we the the even the things that we've talked about today, like so Joliet's journals, he lost everything. I can't imagine, like, personally, how devastating that must have been to be that close to home and spent all that time and effort uh, in this remarkable trip and documenting it all so meticulously and then to have it all taken from you um, uh, in the rapids in the blink of an eye had to be personally devastating. So, given that, like, what do we, what do you think the records are that we're using to base, you know, 
the stuff that we've talked about today, why do we know what we know? Where does it, where does it come from? Indeed. Um, that, I think, is the $64 question. Um, we, we know ostensibly where it came from. It came from a journal that was published in the Jesuit Relations that purported to be Marquette's journal. Um, and it's a beautiful journal. Um, we have his writings from, um, from when he was at the Mission Saint Esprit. Um, we have some other correspondence between him and Deblon, and we have this remarkable journal. But the authorship of that journal has been questioned over the years. Is it indeed the hand of Marquette, or is it the hand of Claude Deblon? Hmm. And if it is the latter, why? Why? Why would Marquette be recast as the perfect missionary, the missionary of intelligence and diplomacy and evangelistic zeal who left us this incredible record? Why would this sort of a personage be created by the Jesuits? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. It is. Maybe they needed maybe they needed uh, an idol or you know somebody that they thought exemplified the perfect Jesuit uh, that uh, the put out there. I don't. Who knows? Who, who knows? Indeed, I I think it's I think it's, and I'm not willing to dismiss. I'm not. I, you know, I'm, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I you know I I don't really still believe in Santa Claus altogether, but I, <laughs> but I also um, want to believe that Marquette's journals are Marquette's journals. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think that, I think we have to dismiss, I think we have to separate the remarkable achievement of the expedition and the reality of, of the expedition um, and the, and the, the mythology of the expedition, which had to do with national identity and had to do with um, with spiritual identity and had to do with a sense of purpose. And I think some of those things, I think we have to be willing to perhaps um, sort those uh, two trajectories a little bit uh, without necessarily um, one diminishing the other, because I don't think that we can really um, under underestimate the significance of the expedition itself. I don't know. I, I don't know. If that's well, that's fascinating. Well, um, we're kind of winding down time here. So I was just kind of wondering for people who might be interested in knowing a little bit more, I think when we talked before, like there, there aren't a huge number of resources to consult on this expedition. Do you have something you would recommend that people uh, check out if they wanted to know a little bit more? Um, it, it's always interesting to start uh, poking around the internet. There, there's a lot out there. I found um, some pieces um, from uh, a Canadian biography, Encyclopedia of Canadian Biography to be very interesting. The Jesuit relations are just absolutely fascinating. They are, they should be a destination for anyone interested in this, just to, to look at them and to look at the language and to look at the scope of of the really remarkable work of the of, of the Jesuits, uh, whether you are of a religious um, inclination or not, they are a impressive uh, group of men, um, and um, I think they are definitely worth looking at. Uh, the Marquette journals have been published in in a variety of different different forms. Um, I've been carrying around a little book for many many years, which I just love. Um, it's called Up Country Voices from the Midwestern Wilderness. It was published by Round River Publishing Company in Madison back in 1985. Um, I, it's just one of my favorites. Um, and, and there's a lot of others, too. The Wisconsin Historical Society, um, they launched a program about 15 years ago uh, called Turning Points in History. Um, you'll find uh, some pretty good Marquette and Joliet uh, materials at, at their site. Um, and I think really, and I haven't looked in Illinois and Michigan, I'm sure that both of those historical societies have some really rich resources as well. I, I think that what's really a cool way to visit these guys is to visit this landscape, 
whether it's by road or by canoe or by combination of both. Look at this country. Look at what they were looking. Look at, at it. It's inspirational today um, in ways that I think are similar to what it was 350 years ago. I love being on the Mississippi River and the Upper River. And be on in the Mississippi River on June 17th, 16, you know, 2023, and just see what it feels like. Oh, that, and take a copy of the journal along and read it while you're sitting in your canoe. Right. And and then when you're done being on the river, you can head to Pikes Peak State Park uh, in Iowa, and you can look out from an overlook over 500 feet above the river at the confluence of the Wisconsin and Mississippi rivers and imagine two parties and birch bark canoes coming through there. Absolutely. And that's usually what I do on, on June 17th is I head up there because that is indeed a magnificent overlook um, and uh, um, about the most uh, beautiful place I can think of on the upper river. It's where I hope one day my mortal remains will be blasted from um, that, 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 very, that very point. So anyway. So what are you up to these days? And do you have any projects you're working on? Anything you'd like to tell folks about? Uh... Um, I'm, I'm really hoping to continue talking about, about, about Marquette and Joliet uh, throughout um, the spring and summer. Um, I've really, um, I, I've really gotten kind of hooked on it again, and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. So I hope to be able to uh, be doing some uh, public programming where talking about doing some Mississippi River um, excursions uh, uh, on Sundays in July, August, and September. Uh, we'll get some people out on the river and actually uh, talk about these guys. Um, and um, other than that, I'm just going to be soaking it all in and, and enjoying um, uh, remember, remembering all of this great stuff. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your expertise with us today on, the, on this remarkable trip from Marquette and Joliet. I really appreciate you taking your time and sharing your knowledge with us. It's been my pleasure, Dean. Um, and I, I hope that we can uh, talk again. And um, I wish you well. Thank you. And now it's time for the Mississippi Minute. If you're interested in events related to the 350th anniversary of the Marquette Joliet Expedition, I have a few recommendations to help you out. The city of Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, which was built on a wide plain just above the confluence of the Wisconsin and Mississippi rivers, is commemorating the anniversary from June 15th to 18th, 2023. Events coincide with the annual Prairie Villa Rendezvous, which includes reenactors as well as a flea market and other events. Events kick off on Thursday evening, June 15th, with live music, then kick into full gear on Friday. Look for demonstrations on traditional crafts, an art fair, tours, live music, lots of food, some dancing, canoe rides, uh, an enthralling beard contest, and much more. If you have trouble finding a place to stay in Prairie du Chien or across the river in the McGregor Marquette area, don't fret it. Uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin and Dubuque, Iowa are each about an hour's drive from Prairie du Chien and they have a lot of rooms. You may also be able to find a place to stay in places in between. If you want to venture out and explore some of the sites associated with the expedition uh, on your own, the overlook of the confluence of the Wisconsin and Mississippi rivers is a must-see. The best view is from Pikes Peak State Park in Iowa, but Wyalusing State Park in Wisconsin is also exceptional. They're both just gorgeous spots, and they will probably be busy places over that weekend. You can also take a scenic drive along the Mississippi via the Great River Road uh, and along Highway 133, which offers some good views of the Wisconsin River and stretches, both of them parallel parts of the route that uh, Joliet and Marquette followed. A little further south, the Illiniwek Village State Historic Site in northeast Missouri, just south of the Des Moines River, is the likely site of the first Illinois village encountered by Marquette and Joliet. That site has a really good uh, interpretive trail with lots of markers and uh, a few reconstructions of, uh, of structures that were likely at that site. It's well worth a stop. I'll put links to all of these in the show notes. Uh, go to mississippivalleytraveler.com slash podcast and select this episode, and you'll see links to all of these and other things mentioned during this episode. Thanks for listening. 
If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to the series on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg. If you want to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that's set in places along the river. Find them wherever books are sold. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time. Mm-hmm.